Hello, everybody, um, and welcome. And I see some familiar faces. I'm really glad that there are some familiar faces here. And um, we're going to get started because we have a lot to cover. My husband is here who is twitching everything, and uh, I will probably send him away to the kitchen where he belongs. So Richard III. And I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make it so that I, you just see the screen and not me. Is that what we're seeing, Master Philip? We're good. Good. You don't see me? Oh, we are, we have joy seeing you. I can carry on. Okay. Yeah. If they just see the slides, that's good. Okay. So King Richard. Uh, was 32 years old when he was killed near Leicester in um, England at the Battle of Bosworth. This was August 22nd, 1485. The victor of the battle was Henry Tudor, and he soon became known as Henry VII. Uh, both to public di publicly display the dead king's body so that there was absolutely no doubt of his victory and then to have Richard's mortal remains interned quickly in a totally inaccessible place, not likely to become a pilgrimage point. Um, this has happened within a few days. Now, whether the new king Henry VII chose the Franciscans or the Greyfriars as they were known, or they petitioned the king directly to be able to intern Richard, Richard's body isn't known. But what is known is on the 25th of August, as the new Tudor king rode toward London, Richard's body was taken by the friars. And I am suspecting a select group of Henry's trusted boys to have a private funerary mass and in a somewhat improvised and too short grave in the choir of that church, he was put in naked and his hands were still bound. When the second Tudor King dissolved, or yes, when the second Tudor King, Henry VIII, dissolved Greyfriars in 1538, Richard remained buried there despite rumors that over the years he'd been, you know, the bones had been dug up and thrown in the local river. Um, and also despite being buried in inner, inner city Leicester, which is England's second largest city, Richard's grave remained largely undisturbed. Um, the Greyfriars Church decayed around it and the site became a private school, a garden, a playground, and finally, the city parking lot. It all did come close to destruction twice, when in the early 17th century, the mayor of Leicester built a huge mansion at this site, uh, just missing the grave. And again, in the 19th century, when there was construction for a new brick outhouse that cut the feet off skeleton. Despite these near misses, there was no further evidence of post-mortem changes or displacement and the orientation of those individual bones are positioned much as they were when he was interned at the exact location of both the priory and the grave that disappeared from memory. So we go to August 2012. The Richard III Society funded a project called Looking for Richard and they contracted the Leicestershire University Archaeological Services to excavate the council parking lot because it seemed to be the only possible place that hadn't been overturned and looked hard at. Um, it was an absolutely absurd long shot. And the mandate was quite simple to find the mortal remains of Richard III. The project's head, Richard Buckley, didn't hold out much hope of finding anything associated with King Richard, saying, and I quote, archaeologists do not, as a rule, seek to excavate the remains of famous people, much less find them. But that's exactly what happened on the second day of that dig. 
when a skeleton that later proved to be Richard III's was uncovered. Though it was fragile after 500 years in the ground, and yes, it was located approximately underneath where that R is, the bones were in remarkable condition. The, the whole idea of Richard III's excavation and finding him was kept a secret. And it, it was kept a pretty bad secret because everyone in Leicestershire and Leicester knew what was going on. And they wanted to keep everything quiet until the real DNA evidence came in and the supporting paleopathology came in. Still rumors spread and popular imagination grew and everybody knew, well, come on, we all just knew it was Richard. Um, the skeleton that was found had to be Richard. Everything seemed to point to that direction. People lined up for hours to see the excavation site. And in the background, I want you to take particular notice of the church in the background, the spire, the spire that's up there. That's going to be important later, that's St. Martin's Church in Leicester. So lineups, and I was very fortunate to skip the line and directly meet Richard Buckley, the head of the uh, archeological excavation. He allowed me to have a direct access to the to the grave site. And here it is. So what we're looking at here is um, on the right hand side of that pit, you'll see a sort of a little yellow ball. That actually marks where Richard's head was. And there's another ball to the left that marks where his feet were. And the space sort of where the water is, is where his chest was. You can see the imprint of this, you know, you, you can see where it is. You can actually, it becomes an, a tangible figure for you. So this went on and on. And finally, a year later, on February 5th, 2013, they all got together, all of the research team got together and they announced that um, indeed the findings of all of the paleopathology and the genetics pointed to that it was indeed King Richard III. There was a huge media scrum at the Guildhall in Leicester and they went all through it. And one of the huge pieces, the center point evidence was a match of Richard's DNA with at least two of his maternal descendants, one of which was born in Toronto and he now lives in London. And this descendant, Michael Ibsen, was traced through the matrilineal line through 17 generations from Anne of York, Richard's sister, down through to now. Richard himself only had one legitimate son and he died in 1484 without any further descendants. Um, there was further geological research or geno genealogical research that led to another individual in Australia. And there has been further um, sort of parallel research that's brought up a number of other descendants. So who was Richard III and why all this fuss? Richard the Plantagenet was the 12th or 13th children of Richard Plantagenet, third Duke of York and Cecily Neville. Uh, he was born October 2nd, 1452 at Fotheringray, Fotheringhay Castle, which is of course the place in 1587 that Mary Queen of Scots met her in. Today, the castle is just a grassy mound and it's really hard to imagine that it wasn't already always such. The church though is still there and well worth a visit. It's the burial site of Richard's brother and father, both victims of the conflict that was to shape the man that Richard became. The conflict, of course, we know as the War of the Roses. Uh, trust the Victorian Sir Walter Scott to so poetically describe a violent civil war. 
This war was the real game of thrones. It was York against Lancaster. The symbols of each house were a white rose and a red rose. And it came down to who had the better claim to the throne of England. And it was decades of turmoil and violence. It was 32 years of household against household and family against family. It was a quagmire of shifting alliances from the first battle of St. Albans in 1455 until the slaughter at Towton which is still the bloodiest battle that was fought on English ground. And that was 1461. That gave the remaining Yorkists the crown and the victory. It sent weakened King Henry VI and the Lancaster, Lancaster cause into the ground. And eventually what would happen is the Yorkists would assassinate Henry VI. I guess that's a very poetic term for it, but they would essentially get rid of him. Richard's brother was now Edward IV. He'd already lost his father and he'd already lost another brother in the Battle of Wakefield when this all started in 1450 or 1460. But the Civil War continued this time between brothers. In 1464, the middle brother, Clarence, was executed in a rather creative way by drowning him in a vat of his favorite wine. And I think that TV writers and script writers should take a note of that, that uh, that is a novel way to go. The family drama continued. Edward, who was now king, went off and secretly married a widow of a minor knight who fought and died for the Lancashire cause, though she was rumored to be beautiful with almost platinum blonde hair. This of course was Elizabeth Woodville. She had family problems of her own and she had two sons, first of all, from her Lancaster marriage and a bevy of brothers and sisters who are absolutely right for the marriage market. In fact, to add to the scandal, Elizabeth's 20-year-old brother, John, married the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, who was very, very rich and nearly 80. And did I mention, most likely not, that the mother, Elizabeth's mother, rumored, was rumored to dabble in love charms and spells. These are very uncertain times. And there's some great books about it that will make you totally shake your head in disbelief and you will think that the authors are making it up, but absolutely not. There was a brief interval of peace of the sort from 1471 until 1483, when it all went really very wrong again. In April 1484, Edward caught a chill out fishing. He developed pneumonia, or maybe it was typhoid fever, or maybe he ate too much and stroked out because he'd grown rather fat. There's an aside here that his grandson, by the way, was Henry VIII. Either way, he died and left his 12 year old son king. Now, given that you know a bit of the background history here, you can imagine that this whole timing wasn't in the very best interest of stability and it created a lot of chaos. We all know what happened next, right? Evil King Richard, or sorry, evil, evil Uncle Richard. He's appoint, he appoints himself protector. He swoops in and while promising on one hand fealty to the new king, his nephew, on the other hand, has the two princes clapped into the tower never to be heard from again. But let me ask you, did Richard really have his nephews murdered so he could usurper the throne? Or was it a politically expedient move? Something to think about. All we know for sure is the prince and the spare disappeared one day late June 1483. 
And then July 6, 1483, Richard and his wife and their son were crowned. So began the shortest reign of any English king, July 1483 to August 22nd, 1485. And here's the march towards Bosworth, where we started today. So, Bosworth. The quick version has it like this. Shadowy Henry Tudor. He's now got himself positioned to be the Lancaster heir. He lands at Milford Haven with French mercenaries, some Lancaster supporters, some disaffected Yorkists in August 7, 1485. He marches into the heart of England, gathering followers along the way. And they all sort of stop and gather at a small market town of Bosworth in Leicestershire. Richard has the larger army. He's by this time emptied out the Tower of London. He's emptied out the artillery. And he has determined once and for all that he's gonna make a stand of this. And he is going to wipe the Lancasters slash Tudors off the map. The opponents start to engage but not all of them, some of them hang back waiting for the most opportune moment. One of them is the Stanleys, the family, the Stanleys. They're a wild card and they could work for either side. The Stanley family were very, very, very well armed and connected. And one of them is married to Henry Tudor's mother, Margaret. So we've got the Stanleys who are the wild card and they're pledged for Richard and they're supposed to fight against Henry Tudor, even though Stanley is married to Margaret, who is Henry Tudor's mother. If we got all this, good. Um, that's a step up from Game of Thrones, I think. And did I mention that the Stanleys had a habit of switching sides freely, depending on which way the political wind was blowing? Yet Richard was prepared to trust them to fight on his side. They clashed for two hours into the battle. Richard saw Henry and decided to charge across the field and end it once and for all. This was a grand chivalry charge against an open battlefield. He succeeded in killing Henry's standard bearer. That's how close he got to this. Richard is unhorsed. It's said that by this time, the area of the field was a boggy quagmire. He yells treason. He's thrown from his horse. Either his helm comes off or he takes it off himself. But from the angle of the, of the wounds that we'll look at later, it looks like his horse bogs down, he's thrown from his horse, he lands on his knees with his head bent forward, and then there's an absolute melee around him. It's possible that somebody or some people jump on him and there's a nick near his jaw and they cut the helm off. It's a frenzied attack, it's quick, it's violent, and it's brutal. Even the Tudor Protagonist, uh, propagandist Shakespeare portrays the king frantically calling for a horse to carry him back to the battle after being knocked out. He gets killed by Richmond, which is not correct. Richmond is by this time, Henry Tudor is by this time well behind the lines, being well protected. It's really the reality is that Richard is killed by Henry's mercenaries and the Stanleys. Richard's witnesses say that Richard was offered a horse and a chance to escape, but Richard said he had placed his cause in God's hands and he would stay the course. Once it was realized that Richard was dead, his army melted away and the day belonged to Henry Tudor. Later, the last King of England to die in battle was found amongst the dead. He'd been stripped of his armor by scavengers 
and he was thrown on the back of a horse and paraded naked back to Leicester, where he had so triumphantly started off earlier that day. Naked, he was publicly displayed, and of, except for, as the chronicles tell us, a coarse cloth covering his privy members. His wounds were visible, and Henry had issued, and strongly it was followed through that nothing, uh, none of the melee wounds attack Richard's head and face. So the operative here was to maintain Richard's face so he could be recognized. And this is actually something that is followed through even today in a military situation. Um, you wanna keep the face of your enemy open so that you can display his remains and make sure that people accept that he is dead. So here's a catalog of the fatal wounds. Now these are the wounds that are only were only deep enough to hit bone. Um, so all of the soft tissue wounds are not showing up here. So these are just the ones deep enough to hit bone. In total, there are 10 what are called perimortem wounds. So those are wounds that are around the time of death that contribute to death. These include rather shallow wounds likely caused by rondel dagger, and you can see at the top of the skull there. There's a scooping depression on the left-hand side that's probably a um, sword, or I'm thinking actually more likely a halberd. This is the halberd. And there's a couple of other examples of them. They are the kind of most common kind of weapon that were used by infantry in the War of the Roses, they were called billmen. And they were more common than swords and could do a considerable amount of damage. And considering that Richard um, Henry's mercenaries, a lot of them were from France and the Low Countries, a lot of them would have been armed with bill hooks and halberds. Looking underneath the skull, the second wound, which is circled on your upper right, is the one that would probably have been the death wound. This is sheared off the bottom of the cranium and has left also another hole that penetrates about 10 and a half centimeters down. This was probably made also by a halbert and also by a rondel. Now just covering rondels, they're again not a weapon that you would see on a lot of arist aristocrats. It's more of a barroom brawl weapon. It's where you grab it with your fist and on the top flat end you hammer it in. It's not pleasant. So here we have a a, um, a combination here where you can see the back of the skull cleaved off with the sword of the halberd. And then you can see the 10 and a half centimeter wound going down into the top of the skull. So there are other wounds. These are called humiliation wounds. In battles throughout history, it's, it's the bloodlust combatants rush and plunge their weapons into the dead or mortally wounded bodies of their enemies. Cuts deep enough to penetrate bone litter the skull. They are covering the jaw and cheekbones. His ribs bear signs of further attacks and his pelvis is also knit, the back of the pelvis. So the the forensic pathology on that one suggests that when that happened, Richard had been tied up, thrown naked over the back of his horse. He was being led by his own herald and that someone had come up behind and literally stabbed him in the buttocks. Is pure humiliation. But again, Richard's face was still recognizable. The battle wounds, the most vicious of them, 
had one thing that was in store for us that was a shock and that you can see is the curvature of the spine. He suffered from a deformity called scoliosis. Now, Shakespeare goes to great lengths in his play, Richard III, to say that Shakespeare, um, Richard was a hunchback, forward bend of the spine. Richard wasn't a hunchback. He had a curvature of the spine. Without that curve, he would have stood about five foot eight, slightly above normal height. With the curve, he stood about 5'4", which is just below normal height. When you go into the contemporary, knowledge, uh, contemporary documents, Richard is described as being small of stature, slim, lightly built, with slender arms and thighs. And actually, it's interesting, when they found the skeleton, there was a question of gender because it was extremely gracile. Looking at the individual vertebrae, the pathological changes suggest that Richard had an adolescent variant of scoliosis, probably started at about 10 to 13 years of old age. And this is an idiopathic um, disease. We don't know why it happens. It predominantly happens in three to four children out of a thousand in the UK. 90% of them don't ever need treatment. Uh, the granddaughter of Queen Elizabeth, our, our current queen, Eugenie, has scoliosis. She's had surgery for it, but Elizabeth Taylor, Liza Minnelli, a lot of other people have scoliosis. It, it, they live with it. It's not as pronounced as this. Typically, as I said, it begins around puberty, and typically girls are more affected than boys. However, what we need to know here is it's progressive. And as Richard aged, the changes in his spine would have com compromised his breathing and he would have become, he, he would have become an increasingly painful and likely bad tempered individual. The skeleton also shows arthritic changes that aren't inconsistent with his lifestyle. So, Along with the scoliosis, he's now showing arthritis, arthritis in his pelvis and his knees, um, around his shoulders that come from long hours of riding and weapons training. So, <clears throat> excuse me, using the clinical examples of patients from today, such as this one, who's got almost the same curvature as Richard does, it's assumed that Richard would have stood with his center of gravity slightly shifted to the one side, leaving his shoulders slightly higher on the right than his left. This would have been his comfortable um, posture at rest. And yes, it would have given a look that he was slightly humpbacked. Um, there would have been a gait change when walking. It would have been maybe looked at as a limp. His arms would have moved with a bit more of a side to side swing rather than a front to back. When Richard was tired, these would have been much more pronounced. There's no historical evidence that Richard's scoliosis um, compromised his physical abilities to ride and hunt and wear heavy plate armor and use the weapons of his class. Indeed, in the year, days leading up to Bosworth, he was enthusiastically hunting deer in Sherwood Forest. This young man is a War of the Roses reenactor, and his name is Dominique Smee, and he has the same degree of scoliosis as Richard. So he underwent a series of armored challenges and to try and establish if, what the practical limitations with somebody with that degree of scoliosis was wearing the armor of the period. As long as Dominique was mounted, the playing field was level. Richard was known to be an absolutely superb rider, and the salary of the day actually support um, someone with a back injury or a back deformity like scoliosis. In the saddle, they're actually almost standing up straight. Once dismounted, however, the mobility is strongly, severely compromised. 
Dominique starts to have problems breathing and the effects of the scoliosis now with the armor are pushing on his lung, his ribs and limiting his lung capacity. He gets more and more wind, easier winded and tired. And so it's likely that Richard suffered the same issues. When Richard was alive, of course, there's no surviving mention of his scoliosis. And given the sheer physical nature of 15th century society on all levels, there were always injuries, whether it was occupational or disease. The clothes of the period were styled with a lot of heavy padding, especially through the shoulders. So really Richard's condition wouldn't have been so obvious as we might think. And it would have been known only by those close to him and trusted by him and of course by his armor. Curiously, however, one thing has been revealed. The isotope analysis of Richard's teeth and bones indicated that during his very short tenure as king, his, his um, consumption of alcohol increased substantially. And this is not to say that Richard now became sort of a, a binge drinker. It basically suggests that as the king was now constantly on the move more, and the summer before Bosworth, he went on a full um, extensive progress from London all the way up to York with numerous side trips, his ability to rest and take a day off was just not there anymore. The increase in, in wine consumption is probably because the man was just simply more painful and he was hoping that the wine would dull the edge of it all. And it, this is an era where we don't have Tylenol 3. As mentioned, Richard's skeleton was remarkably preserved, including his teeth and jaw alignment. So we can have a good look at his dental health. Richard was very upper class, of course, and he had a variety of meals, often very richly prepared. We know that from earlier isotope analysis of his teeth that it was also a diet rich in meat and fish. Dining every day for someone of Richard's status meant four to five dishes per meal. They might include boiled and baked meats and spiced wines, stewed swan, uh, a mess of songbirds, larks and pies. 195 days of the year, the church required them to be fish days. So the diet switched to such favorites as lampreys baked in bear juice and eels in almond cream. Oddly enough, puffins and beavers were also considered fish. Sweet sauces, syrups, comfits were all popular way to end the meal, washed down with wine. So the tea. Well, they do show evidence of a very rich diet. He's missing several of his back molars. They were probably extracted by a barber surgeon because of decay. They also show uh, evidence of grinding his teeth. People often unconsciously grind their teeth under stress or chronic pain, and Richard was no different. The teeth also show mineral deposits around um, the surfaces as well as a tartar buildup. Interestingly, the deposits are extensive, but at the same time are not consistent. This suggests that Richard used a tooth stick to brush and pick his teeth. Such sticks are still used in areas of the Middle East today. You'll see there's a missing front tooth that's assumed to be a injury that occurred around the time of his death as it shows no signs of healing. Now I have a warning, take a deep breath, everyone. I have a warning for the squeamish. Okay. When Richard's remains were removed from the grave, sediment and soil samples were taken from underneath the pelvic area and the skull. Analysis of these soil samples in the pelvic region has shown that Richard was infected with intestinal roundworms. 
It's here that we get a window on a bit of the soft tissue health of Richard III. Brown worm eggs are remarkably resilient. They can remain viable in the soil for up to 10 years. And archeological samples have been found that are up to 25,000 years old. Intestinal roundworms can grow to be about a foot long when mature. And the life cycle depends on getting into the host, which is us, by eating contaminated fecal, fecal contaminated raw or undercooked food. The eggs, once eaten, hatch in the stomach, the larvae go to the lungs where they produce a cough, they're swallowed back into the stomach where the adults mature, they feed off the stomach lining. Uh, I did warn you that was, this was not for the squeamish. And the whole cycle is repeated when the eggs are shed again in the feces. Occasionally, the adult brown worms are severe enough that the eggs and the adults are also found in the feces. It's very, very common in the medieval period. And common enough that they're a first thing that people look for in an archaeological as an archaeological contaminant in soil and grave pits. That's the only parasite Richard had, which meant that for the most part, he lived a wet, his food was very well cooked, he liked his meat very well cooked, and that for the most part, hygienically, his life was pretty good. Today, just to take a step back, it's about, it's estimated that there's about 2 million people infected with roundworms, and they usually pick the initial infection up as children. The United States, in 1987, there was 0.8% children infected with roundworms. Usually there's no symptoms, but you know, there could be anemia, a cough, fever, general feeling of unwellness. Interesting that if you're a gardener, you know about um, shrubs and herbs called wormwood and tansy. Those would have been prescribed. They have high levels of tannic acid concentrations in them, and they, <clears throat> they make the basis for some of the medications that are still used today to treat roundworms. So that's enough of that, I think. There was a legal battle once we found Richard's remains. Although they were found in 2012, it took three years of legal wrangling before the reinterment process could finally be organized. In much the same way as medieval towns and churches argued over the acquisition of holy relics, so too there was an argument over Richard. Some of his collateral descendants argued that Richard should have been given a choice in burial between York and Leicester. And if he was given that choice, he would have chosen York since at one point he was Lord of the North. He was, he was the royal voice in the North. Of course, it went back and forward and eventually the court decided for, in the end for Leicester. The stage was set for the actual reinterment of King Richard's bones. So a reinterment is not a recreation of a medieval funeral. Richard had already had a funeral, perhaps it's not as lavish as he deserved as an anointed king, but the appropriate prayers and office of the dead was nonetheless said. This reinterment was an Anglican rite with elements of pre-Reformation Catholic and living history woven into it. I was fortunate to be able to attend the event. It was a week at the end of March, 2015. Thousands of people, thousands of people gathered in Leicester for the celebration of the king's life and death. There were white roses for York everywhere. The skeletal rain, um, remains were 
each bone was very carefully wrapped in linen bags that were sewn by hand by some school children. It was put into the coffin that one of his descendants, Michael Ibsen, the one from Toronto had made. It first followed the route from Leicester to Bosworth as it would have taken that day in August, 1485. And then it came back on a gun carriage and was taken through the city to be buried close to where they found it. Again, a reminder of that church in the background. What stays with me at this point in Richard's journey is people threw roses and people threw so many roses on the coffin as it went through the city. There were so many people there and there was very quiet clapping. There was no cheering. It was just very subdued people clapping as the carriage and the procession went by. It was taken into uh, the church of St. Martin's. That was the church that you saw the spire, spire of. It was received into the church and it would lay there for the remainder of the week so that the public could file by it. And there was, every day there were masses and services said for Richard's repose. It was covered by this absolutely beautiful embroidered pall, which is black velvet. And on one side of it, this side that you see was Richard's past life, a celebration of his past victories and his past loves his wife his children and on the other side is a is is a depiction of richard's life after discovery because in truth richard's life now had been divided into post pre and post bosworth then the truly totally unexpected happened people from everywhere started showing up lineups were two to four hours long to pass the coffin. In some of these lineups, some of the cafes and stores were bringing tea trolleys down the lines with teas and biscuits and water for people who showed up. Over 20,000 people showed up. They lined up and you can see this line snakes all the way to the beginning of the church. The church had to extend its hours, and so many white roses were left for Richard that extra volunteers had to come and collect them and weave them back into, they put them back into wreaths and arrangements into the church. I was um, briefly commandeered picking up white roses. The press were everywhere. Every evening on the telly, were recaps of the day's events and outlines of what was to come. In the back of this picture is, is a, the BBC set up a studio where the likes of Dr. David Starkey and Helen Castor and Philippa Gregory um, were invited to come and spar and spar they did. I was interviewed for BBC Radio twice. And the question of course was, um, question of the day. Why all this fuss about Richard III? For me, I was vice chairman of the Richard III Society of Canada at the time, and I said it wasn't so much the man. It was the period in history. Everything was balanced, and then it started to shift and change. And it was, it was just that time, I guess, looking at it now, I would say it's just that time when you know, you've got morning and night still fighting for control. In that summer of 1485, you start to get the genesis of what I would consider, consider the early modern um, period in English history. So, 
they ended up putting on fabulous concerts, services, masses, lectures, the whole week. It was a bit overwhelming. I really have to say it just, it was amazing. There were fireworks. Um, this was a celebration. This was a reinterment, but it was also a celebration of a life. One event, some events, however, did privately stand out for me. One event was happened at a Catholic church, um, basically the only other Catholic, the only Catholic church in Leicester that was reestablished after the Reformation. It was actually, this church was actually rebuilt in the 1950s. Um, and you are really welcome at this point to be thinking that I spent my entire week in Leicester in churches and you're not far off. So I went to um, the Church of the Holy Cross, which is a priory, it's a Dominican, repri uh, Dominican, re Dominican priory. And uh, a friend of mine is a third order Dominican. So he got me into the priory and into the masses and some of the things that were going on specifically in the priory. What you have here is a very interesting picture. The man in the center wearing, sitting down is the arch, is the Cardinal of England. The roses, the white flowers on that tree were made in honor of all of the people who fought at Bosworth, both Yorkists and Lancaster, rich, poor, whichever. What the man is wearing, however, he's wearing what's called the Westminster vestment. It's believed to be from the royal wardrobe of Richard III. And tradition speculates that it was worn by the Benedictine monks of Westminster Abbey during the coronation, July 6, 1483. This is an absolutely stunning example of Opus Angliorium. And I couldn't help notice that the altar covering that um, is facing the black and gold altar covering was exactly the same fabric as I was to later make my Eldamerian coronation dress up out of. This fabric is actually was inspired by um, a portrait of Richard III that was made in 1470 by a Flemish artist. So this beautiful chasm, well, it, I, I saw it by a couple of different names. It was called um, a surcoat and a couple of other things. But to get on with this, this is uh, Opus Angliorium. I, if you can look it up and get a closer look out of it, of it, I would highly recommend it. It's absolutely exquisite. It hasn't been worn before until this time and it's likely not to be worn again. And it was um, a real honor to see it. So the next thing that stood out for me was again, because of my friend, the lay Dominican, um, I got to join about 40 monks and the rest of the congregation in a procession through the older parts of Leicester, past the ruins of Greyfriars to St. Martin's Church with all the bells and the, the great pomp and reverence that the Catholic Church can come up with. When we got to St. Martin's, permission was sought to by the Cardinal of England to enter the Anglican clergy, to enter the Anglican Church, and he was greeted by the incumbent Anglican clergy. And somehow I found myself swept along inside with the Dominicans and the laity and found myself sitting barely 10 feet away from the coffin of the king. I was handed a mass order and found myself chanting the responsorials for the 15th century office of the dead. That really stuck in my mind and, and 
with the incense and the echoes through the church, I can still hear it. The actual reinterment was done at the end of the week, and it was officiated by the Archbishop of Canterbury with royal representation from the Countess of Wessex and the Duke of Gloucester. We all had to go through uh, security checks and had to be in our places 45 minutes before they would, they would or might arrive. And then we had to wait until they were well clear of the area. By this time, at the end of the week, you're starting to see a lot of familiar faces, spontaneous discussions about armor are popping up between Dr. Tobias Capwell, who's on the black horse here, and Dominique Swell on the white horse, who was our scoliosis um, uh, reenactor. I found myself tying a prayer ribbon onto a fence with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he later waited at the corner one night with me, waiting until my ride could pick me up. Because of the crowds, the final delivery of Richard's tomb had to be made in the night. And the honor guards also had limited practice time and were practicing during the night. The tomb itself was dug down into the floor of the church near the altar. They took the coffin and they lowered it into the, into the tomb. There was a mass of, not a funerary mass, <clears throat> it was a mass of, of almost a regeneration mass. It was an acknowledgement of a life, a death, and a life found again. This prayer book, <clears throat> this prayer book was found in Richard's tent after Bosworth. And it ended up being given to Henry's mother, Margaret Beaufort, who in turn gave it to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it has been in the Lambert Library ever since. Inside it, Richard had inscribed a prayer in his own hand. It said, it says, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, deign to free me, your servant, King Richard, from every tribulation, sorrow, and trouble in which I am placed. The tomb itself was then sealed, and it's a very simple tomb. There's nothing, I mean, there were discussions about trying to make it look Gothic and medieval, but in the end, it's very simple and elegant. Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, this is a, the, the Queen's Poet Laureate, Caroline Duffy. She scribed this and Benedict Cumberbatch did a, I'm not a fan of him, but he did a remarkable rendition of this. It, to me, symbolized the entire, the entire finding of Richard and returning him back to the place in history where he should have been. Are there any questions? Amazing how much more recognition he got for being found 800 years later than ever, even if like he hadn't have been killed by the new king, which does make it awkward for funerary masses. Uh, but like there was more people who paid respects to him than existed in England at the time. I I thought, well, there was a couple of things. I thought one day as I was sitting there that the Tudor propaganda machine must be, must have been absolutely spinning in horror. Um, one, one time, um, somebody on Richard's statue, which was during the course of the week, absolutely covered in white roses. One time, somebody, not me, put a red rose. And it was 
oh my god it it, it was horrifying <laughs> and the, they got security to remove the offending item <laughs> it, it was like that um i was the the other interview i had with the bbc was um she asked are you a supporter of york or lancaster and i said um i'm a tutor and it got sort of the the um the reporter went like okay and i said well think about it for 32 years you've been sending your children off to fight in a absolutely brutal civil war and if they're not fighting your crops are being despoiled the economy is a mess i said what would you rather live under york or lancaster peace or civil war if you're on the ground if you're a peasant on the ground you really don't care who's in charge as long as you can go about your business peacefully so the greater politics of the situation and the ebb and tide that go across Bosworth and all of the other War of the Roses battles don't really mean anything if you're there. You just want peace. Absolutely. You want to be able to feed your kids and know that you're yes. going to wake up tomorrow. Like Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I know people are going to have to run to class because there's a minute till the next class. Um, but I, I want to echo the the thanks that are in the chat because story time with saying was is amazing and it was lovely. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. <laughs> um, yeah, it was it was a pretty intense week. Um, Gosh, I can't even imagine. I was I landed. Uh, my friends picked me up at the airport and drove me directly to the University of Leicester where they were having a conference. This was prior to everything. This was the beginning of it and just sort of uh, rolled me out of the car. Um, that being said, on my return trip, I was even more, I was just, I was totally exhausted. I yes. had a week of, of just the most amazing in-depth um, experience. And I showed up very early at the British Airways desk and um, I said, I just want to check and find a corner and flop. And we got talking and I, I showed her my pictures. And she said that she would, um, the lady at the gate said she would have loved to have gone, but couldn't get off work. So we parted and the upshot of it was when I was called to board, she had put me on business first class with a bed. <laughs> and I had been upgraded like, astronomically so I had a bed oh. <laughs> and I got on the plane and it was their dreamliner service and I got on the plane and I thought oh my god I'm in the wrong place and they're handing me champagne and hors d'oeuvres and I'm thinking yeah <laughs> I just want to sleep <laughs> but you know Goodness. to be able to absolutely sit 10 feet from an anointed king of England, the last king of England to die in a, a battle, the one that sort of shifts the whole, the whole dynamics between middle age and modern age. Um, I will never be the same. Oh, no, of course not. I, I will, I, it just totally changes you. And to be able to have had the opportunity to go back to be there in 2019, 2012 when you know that grave had just been exhumed and to look at that space and to see where Richard's head was and, and his his body was um now when you go there they have it all closed in in glass and it's part of a visitor center and they actually have a hologram of this skeleton over that it's not the same no, when I, when I looked down there, it was raw. It was, you know, it's you talk about us in the SCA looking for that moment that we feel where we might have finally connected with something. Mm -hmm. That was my moment, and and it came almost. It was very 
very ser uh, serendipitous. It was a surprise. And um, yeah, it was, it was great to have that private time with Richard. Just, just yes, his, his skeleton was gone, but still it was a very private time for me with, with the essence of the person. Mm -hmm. and, sure. Yeah, it's very different. <laughs>